Okay, so thank you, Father Chris, for joining us for this Panadi Shed interview. Today, we're going to be focusing on St. Francis de Sales, as we have a big year coming up in the Salesian family. Could you start us off a little bit by telling us about what is it that you know and love about St. Francis de Sales' charism and character? Yeah, well, it is a big year, 400 years since uh, the death of St. Francis de Sales coming up next year. Um, of course, he was born in a, <clears throat> and lived in a time that's uh, so different from our own. Um, and yet he speaks a message about the gospel that still remains uh, you know, pertinent for today. He, he was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore, the country of Savoy, which um, now is part of Italy and part of, uh, of France. So it actually, the, the Duchy of Savoy included uh, Piedmont, where Don Bosco was later born. Um, so most people think Don Bosco was born in Italy, but in fact, he was born in um, the kingdom of Sardinia, which included Piedmont, Sardinia, and the parts of France over the, over the mountains. And that was all ruled by the House of Savoy still at that time. So Francis was born in um, 1567, the 21st of August, and he was the eldest of uh, 13 children, but only eight of them sort of survived to... Uh, to um, or beyond childhood, but his mum was only fourteen when she was when he was born, and his father was um, in his forties, so nearly a thirty-year gap between mother and father. But that wasn't unusual at the at the time. He was um, born very premature, and they didn't think he would survive. And so he was um, at various times in his life later on. Um, sickly, and most likely it was from being uh, so born so prematurely. But he had an amazing education. He lived. He was born into this uh, noble family. Um, they weren't. They were well off, but not wealthy. Um, but his father invested a lot in his uh, his education. So he went to school in Annecy and. And then later on, he did high school or thereabouts in, uh, in Paris, in France. And then later on, got a doctorate from the University of Padua um, in what is today Italy. He had a secret vocation to the priesthood, um, but he didn't tell his dad. Um, but eventually, um, his dad came around to that and he was um, ordained a priest in uh, 1593 in December. He then spent four years as a missionary in a, in a Protestant area and converted all of that area back to, uh, back to Catholicism. Um, he was later appointed the Bishop of Geneva, but he never lived in Geneva because that was under the control of a group of Protestants called the Calvinists. And uh, they had forbidden any Catholics from entering the city and prevent um, any Catholic uh, worship uh, was uh, completely forbidden. But as the bishop, he was much loved. He used to, um, used to do the catechism, you know, the RE lessons for the kids of the town and in the, uh, in the cathedral. And the church would be packed, not just with the kids, but with their parents and that sort of thing. And he would, uh, he would um, you know, sort of play up the act out uh, things and have everyone laughing and applauding and all sorts of things. And uh, when, he, when she was in, uh, in, if she was visiting Annecy, even his mum came to his catechism classes. So he's much loved as a preacher and uh, he would, uh, specifically had a confessional built so that at the back of the cathedral because the poor um, were considered too smelly and they didn't want to disrupt anyone so he put a, a confessional at the back so that the poor people could come and um, and he, and uh, 
make their confession to him. He was a very famous preacher in his own times, and he was <clears throat> asked to go and uh, preach um, on many, many occasions, and preaching was a big deal in those days. It was, it was a social event as well as a religious event, and so he would be invited to a particular city and he would have to preach every day in the, in the main church of the town uh, for the whole of Lent, for instance, or the whole of Advent. Um, and he would preach every day except Saturdays. And on Saturdays, he just heard confessions all day. So, and in between times, he'd go and visit the hospitals and the prisons and the, the poor in their houses and all sorts of things. So he's pretty amazing. He had a marvelous personality too. Um, he's sort of naturally friendly and calm and reflective. Um, and of course, people talk a lot about his, the gentleness of St. Francis de Sales. And the rector major mentions that in the Strena, which we'll get to. Um, but that's a really difficult word. The French word is douceur, mm -hmm. which can mean, um, gentle it can also mean sweet or friendly or compassionate or you know so I guess you'd say in a way as a person he was the complete package in Frank in fact one time when he was in uh, Paris in 1619 he met a young priest called Vincent de Paul we know him as St. Vincent de Paul, but at that stage, he hadn't even started the work that he'd become famous for. And uh, Francis and Vincent became very, very good friends. And uh, Vincent de Paul said that Francis reminded him more than anyone who walked around of the person of Jesus. So I don't think you can get much a higher sort of praise than that. Yeah, well, wow, what interesting life and so many things I'd never even known about him. I did know a little bit about his family, but yeah, not all those little finer details about him. Um, so knowing all that, knowing his life, what can you share with us, Father Chris, about his obstacles and the opposition he faced in his life and how we can learn from that? Yeah, so Tegan, perhaps rather than an obstacle, perhaps a moment of crisis in his life, I mentioned that he was, uh, you know, went to Paris sort of for, sort of for high school and, in, and then uni, I guess, too, you know. So when he was 19, so in the winter of 1586, 1587, um, he fell into a deep spiritual crisis. He'd been studying um, his normal school and uni work, um, but he was also studying and going to some theology and scripture lessons and that sort of thing. And there was a particular um, Benedictine um, scholar, biblical scholar, who taught him about, the, who was giving a series of lessons on the Song of Songs. And Francis thought that that was just fantastic. And the Song of Songs is a collection of poems, really, um, from the Bible about um, two lovers and how they desire to be with each other and how they really feel the absence of each other if they're apart and how they go looking for each other and searching each other out. And, and this, uh, this uh, priest sort of used this as this is the story of the love story, if you like, between God and, and people. So from that moment on, Francis sort of saw the spiritual life as a, as a love story. But there were also a lot of lectures and that sort of thing that he'd been to and he'd been hearing and everyone was talking about um, predestination, whether God predestined some to be saved and some to be uh, to be damned and uh, this really got under Francis's skin you know because he'd always loved God very much and always felt very loved by God in fact it's it's said that his 
first um, first sentence, full sentence, and I don't know whether this is completely true, but this is what the biographers say, um, was that his first full sentence was, my mother and God loved me very much. So I guess it does capture both his love for his mum and the love of God that he felt. But he felt that somehow or other he got it into his mind and into his heart that um, he was not going to be amongst those whom God would save. And so he fell into this deep anxiety of, well, uh, I'm not going to be with the God I love uh, forever. And his anxiety become depression and his depression meant that he didn't eat or didn't sleep. And so for six weeks, he was, you know, just about at death's door um, because of this uh, depression and illness that he was experiencing. One day he was sort of, he went to a church that he really liked to go to to pray. And he said the, He's kneeling in front of the uh, the statue um, of Our Lady, and he's praying to to Mary to relieve him. And he says the memorare, and at that moment, he says it it was like you know the com illness was completely gone. But one of the things we know that during that illness um, and crisis, spiritual crisis. He never gave up on loving God. And he wrote in his notebooks, um, oh God, even if I cannot love you forever in eternity, let me love you in this life now. And of course, that crisis then became the pivotal moment of his whole life because he really did live then the spiritual life as this love story between him and God. Um, and he went on to, to teach people about that. So I guess when we face crisis or difficulties, maybe not crises, but difficulties, of course, we should seek out the right guidance, both medical and psychological. Um, but the more we can keep on loving, um, then I think the more we will be able to uh, to move forward um, as well with patience and kindness. Yeah, well, wow, that's such a beautiful sentiment. I think that leads in well to the next question, which is directly talking about our strena for next year, which the rector major always releases into the Salesian family. So for next yep. year, it is... A quote itself from St. Francis de Sales, do all things through love, nothing through constraint. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, um, this is a really interesting quote. And I think the rector majors um, chosen pretty well here. But uh, let me just tell you a little bit of a story first, because it sets the context for it. Um, in 16, uh, so Francis became bishop in 1602, and then in 1604, he went um, into France, left Savoy, went into France, and he went to the city of Dijon, where he'd been invited to preach Lent. And uh, there he met and become lifelong friends with um, a family called the Fremio family. And um, they were one of the leading families in the, in the city. Um, the father, Benin, uh, he was president of the Parliament of Burgundy, um, so the top lawyer, really. Um, his son, Andre, um, had just been appointed the Archbishop of Brugg. And then uh, there was uh, his daughter, the wife, had... Uh, his wife, Marguerite, had already died, but uh, his daughter was Jean Francis de Rubitan, the Baroness of uh, de Chantal. And of course, we know her as Jane de Chantal, or Saint Jane de Chantal, actually. But she was a widow with three small children, and 
She was living in very, very difficult circumstances at the time. Um, now, Francis became friends with the whole family, but particularly with, uh, with Jane Francis de Chantel. And he became uh, her spiritual advisor. Later on, they would go on together to found the Order of the Visitation. So the quote that the rector major has chosen, um, it comes from one of the many letters that Jane and Francis exchanged. In fact, it's just a few months after they met. And um, at this stage of her life, Jane's in a bit of a, an emotional and spiritual mess. You know, it's some years since her husband has died, but um, she's still grieving the tragic loss of her husband, uh, Christoph. She's forced to live with her very, very difficult um, father-in-law. And if she and the children don't live there, then he's going to disinherit the children. So um, she's extremely anxious about her own spiritual life as well. Um, and she's prone to be a little bit erratic, to be uh, to go to extremes, and um, she's also overly eager to be holy. You know, probably today we would say that she was in dire need of, uh, you know, uh, psychological or even psychiatric care. Um, but so Francis sort of he realizes that she just needs to find some personal and spiritual peace. And that that's not something that can be forced. That can only come about through patient love. And so this is where he writes to her to do all through love, nothing by force. Now, our strena, the English version of the strena uses the word uh, uh, constraint. Um, the French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese versions of the of the strena say do all by love nothing by force and the original french uses the word force too so it, it i think that helps us to understand and gives us a better appreciation because constraints not a word that we sort of are particularly familiar with but this quote is often put side by side with another saying of Francis, and that is, those who love to make themselves feared, fear to make themselves loved, and they become more fearful than anyone else. For others fear only them, but they're afraid of everyone. And so I think we get the idea that the quote um, the director major is chosen for the strena, do all by love, nothing by force, um, is best seen in this context. It's all about relationships. It's about living um, life as this love story uh, with God. It's about using persuasion rather than force. And I think it's about the spiritual freedom to that... Um, that comes as the fruit of a fruit of love. Yeah, well, I didn't, yeah, didn't know that that was the full story behind that quote. So I don't think a lot of people would have known that either. Thanks, Father Chris. From that, uh, what would you say we can pick as three important aspects of that story or that quote? One of the things that the Rector Major Father Anel does is he emphasizes the importance of the heart you know, in his, in his message um, that's accompanying. And of course, we'll, we'll get some more um, of his ideas because in January, um, there'll be a longer letter from the Rector Major talking about, uh, talking about the strena. But he, he focuses in on the heart and that's really important for Francis. It's at the very core of his spirituality. Because Francis uses the heart and the image of the heart a lot in his writings and in his preachings. But he's using it in the biblical sense, um, by which I mean he's using it in the same sense as the Bible does. We're used to thinking about 
heart and head being separate things. And we think with our minds and our in our heads and we sort of experience emotions in, in our heart. Um, but in the biblical sense, the heart is the very core of our being. And the heart can the heart can think as well as feel. The heart ponders. The heart is the place where the person encounters God. The heart can even decide and make decisions. So Francis is using it in this very holistic sense. So it's in our hearts that we experience the wonder of God's love and um, are able to embrace that love and to follow the way of love um, to which Jesus calls us. And I think that then leads us directly into the second point that the rector major uh, points out to is that holiness is for everyone. You know, we're used to the strena a few years back, holiness for all. Um, and this is very much, uh, Don Bosco's using this idea, but where has he got it from? From the person um, he called the Salesian family after, St. Francis de Sales. So for Francis, remember we said before that um, the spiritual life is a love story, the story of our deep love for God and our neighbour, love of God and neighbour as Jesus teaches us, but it's about filling our hearts with Jesus' love, cultivating that love of Jesus and for Jesus in the same way as we would um, cultivate the love that we share with a friend or with members of our family or even our special beloved one, you know, that we nourish um, the love of God in our hearts um, so that then with our hearts filled with the love of God, then we allow that to very naturally overflow into every aspect of our, of our life. And I think, um, you know, so holiness is for all, and um, it comes from our hearts. The, the, third, um, the third thing I think the Rector Major picks on is the cultivation of virtue, uh, good, good relational qualities um, in our lives. Now, the Rector Major highlights um, gentleness, which we've already, we've already mentioned. Uh, Francis was renowned for that. Um, and that's the virtue that allows us to be pleasant, to be kind, friendly, um, amiable, compassionate, and so on. In other words, the, the virtue that in the life of Francis allowed him to be so Christ-like. But he also talks about um, in, in, his, in his writings and in his preachings, lots of other virtues like patience, humility, uh, friendliness, uh, chastity, understood as unselfish love and, and many other virtues. So I think cultivation of virtue is another one. And I'm going to add a fourth. I know you said three, but I'm going yes. to add a fourth because the rector major picks up on this. Um, and he says, in fact, as Salesians, we can use our gentleness um, as missionaries. And it's, it's, a, it's a missionary quality. Um, now, Francis was a great mission, missionary, sorry, you know, in his, <clears throat> in his four years, uh, 1594 to 1598 as a missionary in the Chablis, where he basically converted this whole area of, you know, 40, 50,000 people back to their Catholic faith, which they'd been forced to give up um, when the Calvinists of Geneva um, invaded the area and took over and banned everything Catholic, basically. But as a preacher, whether he was preaching wherever, he was always a missionary in the sense of proclaiming the love of God in his writings and in his very way of life. So Francis said that the goal of his preaching was... Um, 
the same as the goal of, of um, Jesus' mission. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. So I'd say this is actually Francis's life mission to, to give us, to, the, to allow other people, or to offer other people the fullness of life that comes with loving Jesus and following the way of Jesus. And so we're all capable of being holy, of living lives of love, and we're all capable of sharing that love with others. And in that way, we're missionaries too, and we're proclaiming um, the good news of Jesus. Um, so they'd be the four things. Yeah, well, I think you can really see in those four why Don Bosco cared so much about St. Francis de Sales. You can see how that comes through in our Salesian charism today. To finish on two questions, Father Chris, on a more personal note, you obviously know so much about St. Francis de Sales, but for you personally, what inspires you from him and what might you like to ask or know more about his life? Yep. Thanks, Tegan. Um, as I've read and studied in the, the life of Francis, um, I know now why uh, Don Bosco, when Don Bosco was ordained, he said that one of his ordination resolutions was um, the gentleness and loving kindness of St. Francis de Sales will be my guide. And I know now why he write, wrote that or, or chose that um, because it, it's, um, it's Francis's, you know, his zeal, his commitment to, to what he's doing, his, and uh, the, but then the sort of this gentle, persuasive, friendly, engaging way in which he, he did it. And of course, Francis, you know, says uh, preaching has to be heart to heart. Our relationships need to be heart to heart. And of course, this was the very thing that, that inspired Don Bosco. And so um, it's in our work as, uh, as uh, members of the Salesian family that we try to engage with each other um, heart to heart. So that's sort of what inspires me. I would love to ask Francis de Sales, and Hopefully one day I get a chance when I, you know, we're all upstairs. Um, but I think I ask him, you know, was was Don Bosco spot on when in the way he? Do you think he faithfully, you know, interpreted and adapted, um, you know, your spirituality for the young people of his day? And I suppose I would like to ask that question. Um, just to get it confirmed, because I'm pretty sure he did. Because if Francis is saying, um, you know, to be, uh, to be a holy person, to be a loving person, um, live your life, uh, live a life of unselfish love, do your Christian duties according to your age, health, state of uh, life, etc., um, and be persevering and joyful in doing them. You know, well, it's not word for word for Don Bosco, but some of Don Bosco's key things. So Don Bosco, if you read um, Magoni, Savio, Bezucco, those, those books, lives of, written by Don Bosco, of those three young fellows, and what's he telling them? At the core, he's telling them happiness. Well, there's Francis's joyfulness. Um, duties, well, they're one-on-one -on -one there, and um, active faith, um, which is there's your love of God. You know, so, uh, you know, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence, I guess, between Francis and, uh, and uh, Don Bosco, but um, Don Bosco was certainly inspired by Francis de Sales and uh, used his pastoral method and uh, adapted his spirituality to suit the young people that he was trying to work with. That's such a good question to ask him, I think. And so, like you say, it's something we can feel confident in, but imagine being able to confirm that with him. Well, thank you so much, Father Chris. I think St. Francis de Sales 
who's such an interesting person and hopefully next year is a big year of exploring more about his life and what that means for us as Salesians. So thank you again. You're very welcome. Thanks a million, Sagan.